Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning. It's good to see so many of you here. I wasn't sure because it was actually cold. I was cold. So, so told the family, I said, uh, I said, you know it's cold when I'm shivering. So, but uh, it's warm in here. Got the boiler fixed. It's all toasty. It's all good. And we're going to celebrate today that, uh, that warmth and that time, that fellowship together. There are a number of announcements that are in your bulletin. Um, one is that you're welcome back to the warmth here at 4 p.m. this afternoon for our Bible study as we'll close out one study and begin to look at another one. Possibly. Uh, we have a congregational meeting January 31st to review the annual reports. And we still need folks to help people, the committees. Not just for warm bodies, but because we want your input. And so therefore, if you would consider joining one of these committees, it would be wonderful. Are there any other announcements that... Uh, Oh, we will be taking down the Christmas decorations after worship today. So, there's a note here that Quinn and Neil will not meet because you're going to be up here. Okay, and then we'll be having coffee and donuts downstairs. So, yeah. Are there any other announcements that we need to share at this time? Okay, so two weeks from today, the Methodists will be having a brunch. So, after their church service. So you can go there for some food and some fellowship as well. Any other announcements? Well, seeing none, then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude. Please stand if you are able and join in the responsive call to worship. Lord God, we are glad to come here today. Gladly we come giving thanks for everything you have done for us. 
Gladly we come to sing and pray. And listen to what you say to us. Gladly we come as you have invited us. To worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now let us gladly sing our opening hymn, number 286, The Great Physician. seated. Now let us open in our living Bibles to number 91 for our responsive reading. This is called Victorious Faith and is taken from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? When evil men come to destroy me, they will stumble and fall. Yes, though a mighty army marches against me, my heart shall know no fear. I am confident that God will save me. The one thing I want from God, the thing I seek most of all, is the privilege of meditating in his temple, living in his presence every day of my life, delighting in his incomparable perfections and glory. There I'll be when troubles come. He will hide me. He will set me on a high rock, out of reach of all my enemies. Then I will bring him sacrifices and sing his praises with much joy. Listen to my pleading, Lord. Be merciful and send the help I need. My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me, O my people. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. Oh, do not hide yourself when I am trying to find you. Do not angrily reject your servant. You have been my help in all my trials before. Don't leave me now. Don't forsake me, O God of my salvation. For if my father and mother should abandon me, you would welcome and comfort me. Tell me what to do, O Lord, and make it plain, because I am surrounded by waiting in Don't let them get me, Lord. Don't let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I never did, and all the while are plotting cruelty. I am expecting the Lord to rescue me again, 
so that once again I will see his goodness to me here in the land of the living. Don't be impatient. Wait for the Lord, and he will come and save you. Be brave, stout-hearted, and courageous. Yes, Just wait, and he will help you. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let us rest in God's mercy, using the unison prayer of confession printed in the bulletin, and then by going silently before the Father as individuals. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we sing our Christmas time praise, our own words condemn us. We are thanking you for sending Jesus to show us how life ought to be lived, but we have not often really tried to live like him. Forgive us, Father. We are thanking you for making clear to us in Jesus that there is no limit to your love for us but we are always setting limits on our love for you and for one another. Forgive us, Father. Have mercy on our whole human race, which so often seems to carry on as if Jesus had never lived among us. Write upon our hearts the truth of this saying, that Christ came into the world to save sinners. As Jesus healed the afflicted and restored those who have died, he also forgives our sins and gives us new life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of, I'm sorry, let's first do the prayer of illumination, getting ahead of myself. Let us pray. Mother of all wisdom and father of surprise, your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are your ways our ways. Where we are closed, open us with your word that we might recognize the Christ and follow. Amen. Now our scripture reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 22, and is found on pages 1553 and 1554 in your pew Bible. When reading or hearing this passage, we may find our minds distracted by trying to visualize events that don't fit with our familiar mental images of things like roofs and beds. With today's technology, Paralyzed people can often get around reasonably well, but it might take a miracle to pick up one of our beds and walk around with it. But the bigger miracle in this story is one that is not affected by different cultures or technologies because human nature has not changed. We all need forgiveness for our sins, but it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to bring us to repentance so that we turn in faith to the one who forgives. Some of us may identify more readily with the tax collectors and sinners who are welcome at Jesus' table, and others with the religious traditionalists who wanted an explanation of why Jesus wasn't doing things the way we've always done it. But all of us are sin-sick and our souls in need of his healing. 
Mark 2, 1 through 22. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. This is the word of the Lord. Before I get started, I just had a, a thought as Pauline was reading in the verse 6 in Mark 2, it says, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming who can forgive sins but God alone. And then it says, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? I would have thought that... Uh, that would have been pretty scary for the, uh, the Pharisees and the scribes and the men of the law that were thinking these things. Because apparently Jesus was at least enough of a prophet that he could read their minds. Um, but uh, that doesn't seem to slow them down. And I don't know if that's just willful ignorance or blindness or an inability to adapt to what they're seeing and hearing. This series of passages in here 
Uh, it was tough this week studying. Um, you could preach a lot on any one of these things. And in fact, if you ever go to a place like sermon.com or something, you'll find there's a whole lot of sermons on each one of these events that occurred. Uh, the commentators aren't so good. They all send you to Matthew um, and for their commentary rather than doing their own for Mark. But that, I think that in part deals with the fact that before formal study came about in terms of uh, biblical uh, historical criticism, they kind of tried to harmonize and merge the Gospels. They didn't look at them in their separate contexts, which is what we're doing. We're, we're looking at Mark in, in and of itself because he had a different focus, a different audience, and a different purpose for his writing of the Gospel, even though it was about the same thing. Uh, the life of Jesus. Now, so I looked for these through these passages to look for a thread of something that wove through them all that would fit with the overarching theme of Mark. And I came up with uh, something that I think was is pretty unique, and that is the the fact that for Jesus. What we see here, remember, the Mark's main focus is, who is this guy? Nobody seems to be able to recognize him. And what we see here is that we have a misunderstanding about what's going on, followed by Jesus giving a declaration and then people celebrating and praising him for life. The life that he brings by his presence. Now, in this first passage with the paralytic, I'll be happy to talk to folks outside of worship, if you come to the Bible study at four, um, about the logistics of getting the man down into the room where Jesus was. Right, we can go through the architecture of the day and, and building materials and, and how they might have been able to do this, although sometimes I wonder still how they were able to do it without collapsing the whole thing on them. But they lowered this friend of theirs in faith that Christ would be able to heal. The people were there listening to Jesus. They had, were excited already. They were stoked. I mean, the word of his healings and stuff had gone throughout the region. It notes here that people gathered because they heard he had come home. Which to me was an interesting note because Capernaum was seen as his home. Not Nazareth. They had taken Christ seriously. We haven't seen it here in Mark, but in Nazareth, he gets nearly thrown off a cliff. They, you know, there's a saying that no prophet is uh, accepted in his hometown or honored in his hometown. And apparently, they were no different. And so Capernaum is his base of... Uh, of his, his base location where he comes out of. And the people were excited to see him come home. He's a sort of a hometown hero here. And so we already have this sort of festival attitude, if you will, going on as people pack the room and pack the streets around it and to listen and hear this amazing prophet and man. And these guys wanted to have their friend healed. So they lower him into the room. And Jesus sees their faith Notice, not even the faith of the, of the paralytic. The faith of the friends who brought him. And he says to the man, son, your sins are forgiven. And here we have the first misunderstanding. Again, we know from chapter 1, verse 1, that this is the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, these people particularly the scribes and Pharisees, did not understand Jesus' godhood. And so those who were in the know, as it were, understood the law, had studied the law, said he's blaspheming and who can forgive sins but God alone. They recognized his claim, but they didn't believe it. They did not see him as God. They might have been able to celebrate the healings, they might have been able to celebrate some of the festival activity and an and atmosphere that was there, but be careful about taking God's names and prerogatives 
in vain. Which is a, a reasonable, by the way, I think, um, thing to do. I, I don't want to take God's name in vain or usurp his prerogatives in any way. But they had missed the point of who Christ was. And so Jesus knows that they're doing this, and that's when he says, your sins, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up, take your mat, and walk. And so that you know I can do the first, here comes the second. And he says, get up, take your mat, and go home. And so the guy did. He got up and took his mat and walked out in full view of all. And again, remember, the house was packed so full that they couldn't get any more in. So I'm imagining that he had to sort of push his way through. I doubt that he was raised up by ropes or anything through the roof again. And it says, this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. He showed that he had the ability to forgive sins because he also had the ability to heal the paralytic. He showed who he was to these people, and their, their, their response is to praise God, which is a wonderful thing. But they also say, we've never seen anything like this. They're just dumbfounded in many ways, and they don't know what to make of it, and I don't think they know what to make of Christ. But they're willing to celebrate the life that he brings, regardless of their knowledge of who he is in fullness. And then he goes and he teaches out by the lake and he walks and he calls tax collectors. And again, I could go on for a full sermon or two about uh, Levi himself and tax collectors and sinners. You do realize, well, I mean, even now, who loves the IRS? Ah, I didn't know. I just was, you know, trying to encourage somebody, to be honest. Yet nobody loves the tax man. There's, there's a joke, you know, that uh, about... Uh, a burly man in a bar, and uh, he liked to have a, a sort of a running bet with everybody who came in for drinks. He said he squeezed the lemon as hard as he could in his fist. He was like a bodybuilder, you know, big guy. And he said, if anybody can squeeze anything more out of this, then I'll buy a round of drinks on the house. But if you can't, then you got to buy. Well, this little man comes in, he's average height, average build, glasses, you know, and comes in and says, I'll take you up on that bet. And the big guy looked at him, he just laughed. And the little man takes the lemon and he squeezes it. And three more drops come out. And the burly guy says, oh my, how did he do that? And one of his friends leans over and says, he's the IRS agent. They weren't popular. They were seen as traitors because they were collecting the taxes not for the temple but for the Romans. They were working with the enemy. And Jesus not only calls Levi, Matthew, as one of his disciples, but then he goes to dinner at his house to celebrate the new life that he gains, that Matthew has gained. And Matthew himself talks about it and when he is, his account of his calling is a little more detailed, as you might imagine. And so while he was having dinner at Levi's house, where he had been invited after this radical change of heart through Jesus saying, follow me, and he's celebrating with the only people he knows, his friends, fellow tax collectors and sinners. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, there was the hope that other people would be touched by Jesus the way he was. Celebrating life that came through Christ. And these scribes and Pharisees, the same ones who were so concerned about God's prerogative, are also concerned about holiness, which again, in and of itself, is not a bad thing. But it's misplaced because they don't understand who Jesus is. And they say, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now they ask the disciples, not Jesus. But Jesus hears them, apparently. And again, I, I don't know if you've ever been to a dinner party. Even as I was coming up the stairs before the service, after utilizing the facilities downstairs, I could hear all kinds of noise. 
of people talking and things. And, a, and, and you sounded like quite a crowd. A part of it's the acoustics of this place. Um, but, you know, picking out single conversations. If you've ever been in a crowd, some people say the closest you can come to it is like a, a, a whole gaggle of geese when you're at a cocktail party. Everything just kind of goes around. And yet Jesus, in the midst of this crowd, eating dinner, everybody's talking, he hears them. And he turns to them and he answers them directly. And he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, which would be the men who were questioning. At least they saw themselves as righteous. But the sinners... Jesus was right where he was supposed to be, confounding everybody who was supposed to be in the know. As he led others to new life and to celebrate new life. The third passage goes on about fasting. And again, we could talk a lot about fasting and we will some point in Lent, during Lent. I always have at least one sermon on fasting. And they ask an honest question again. How is it John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Fasting was a regular practice, a spiritual discipline in the day. It's one that's kind of fallen out of favor with us these days, and it's something that, you know, and I'm, I'm as guilty of it as anybody. Um, it's something that maybe we need to understand in, a little better. And, and I, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but fasting can be more than just food. For these days, some of us have medical reasons why we have to eat regularly and at times, etc. Whether it be due to medication or medical condition or whatever. But you can fast from other things. But these, the best known fasting was with food. You fast a couple times a week, sometimes. And Jesus answers utilizing an interesting metaphor. How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. So the time for fasting, the time for discipline, was not while Christ is with them. This was the time for celebration. This was the time for joy. This was the time for living life to the fullest. There'll come a time when he goes, and they'll fast then. Now this image of the bridegroom and the bride is very biblical. It's all through the Old Testament. And guess who it refers to almost every time? God is the, the bridegroom. Israel is the bride, his chosen people. So Christ is basically again claiming that he is God and he is here with his people who were, according to the passage above, the tax collectors and the sinners. The sick and the lame. The ones who recognize their need for God and salvation. And there'll come a day when they will fast. And then he goes on to say, this is new. And again, I'm not going to get into this. We could do a whole series on this. But this is a new kind of teaching. Remember, Mark loves teachings. And you don't, you're not going to be able to get it within the confines and restrictions of your old faith, of your old religion. Because it will burst the wineskin like new wine would burst an old wineskin. Again, come to Bible study, ask me about that, and I'll explain why that works, if you don't understand or know already. Same for those of you that have sewed. I've never sewed, but you know, I do know that cotton shrinks. And I imagine if you put a patch over a, a tear in a shirt, and then it, you haven't pre-washed it, and then you wash the shirt and then the cotton shrinks, you're going to at least get a gather if you don't actually tear it out. New sometimes does not go with old. And these men who were concerned with the old, who were concerned with the established, simply could not come to grips with the celebration that was occurring in the presence of Christ. Sometimes I feel that we in the church are unfortunately much more like those Pharisees and scribes than the tax collectors and sinners. 
We say prayers of confession. We supposedly recognize ourselves as sinners in need of God's grace. We claim the need for salvation through Jesus Christ. And we have confessed and professed our faith in Him alone. But then, when we live out our life, we live it without the celebration that I believe should be there. Even in the church, and I know that, you know, I I'm I'm, was just talking to Karen about this during the week. I'm on the Committee on Preparation for Ministry now, which I'm excited about, because I'm very, very concerned about being Reformed and being Presbyterian. And I think that too much of our denomination has gotten diluted, if you will. People have moved away from that understanding. We're not really Reformed or Presbyterian in a lot of ways anymore. But there's one thing that I rebel against regularly, and that is the nickname of God's Frozen Chosen, which we're known as for a good reason. We don't celebrate as much as perhaps we should. We believe very firmly in the need for Christ in the election of God. You have been selected by God. You have been chosen by Him to be one of His people. He has chosen you. Doesn't matter what sins you committed. Doesn't matter what magnificent things you might have done. Because God is greater than all of that. And He loves you. He loves you so much that His Son came specifically to save us by dying on the cross and shedding His blood for us and then by being raised again so that we could be His people, His children, adopted into His family as we are new creatures by baptism of water and the blood. And yet, do we celebrate yeah, we fellowship, and that's good. But do we celebrate? Do we have this praising of God that was there after the healing of the paralytic? Do we have this party atmosphere where they were all gathered at the guy's dinner at, for dinner at the guy's house because he got saved, and they're celebrating? He's throwing a party. He's giving out everything he can, the best he has. Do we have that idea about not fasting at the moment? Because, you know, Christ is with us now. We have, through the Holy Spirit, His presence with us each and every day. Christ is here, even now. Sometimes we get into hymns, and, and I, I enjoy them. And I'm going to put my son on the spot. He didn't know I was going to be put on the spot. And... You know, some people said he should be a director because he likes to... And I tell you, I take great joy in that because that means he's getting into the music. He's getting into the praising of God. And that's a wonderful thing. Church should not be like the uh, story of the little boy who was about three years old was standing on the pew instead of sitting like he should. His mom was right next to him and he was turned around and he was facing the other people. And he was just smiling at them and moving his head and smiling, and his mom grabs him by the ear and twists it and pulls him and says, sit down. And so he sits down and he starts snuffling a little bit because probably twisting his ear kind of hurt, and she goes, that's better. There's a place for decorum, yes. We don't want people going crazy. But don't ever quench the spirit of celebration of life, the new life that you have gained in Jesus Christ. And i got to tell you something. That celebration is infectious. They say that some people have an infectious smile. Whenever they smile, everybody else has to smile around them. A laugh that's infectious. They start laughing and everybody else starts laughing even if they didn't hear the joke. Well, you know what? A life of celebration is infectious. And if you celebrate your life each and every day, knowing who Jesus Christ really is, even as they did not, then you can't help but witness to the grace and mercy of Christ and lead others to know His love as well. And that is a cause for celebration. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
our next hymn is Christ for the World We Sing, number 344 in your hymnals. One of the ways that we celebrate life in the church itself is during the ordination and installation of elders. Now everybody that is here today, and deacons, everybody that's here today I believe has been ordained already. So this is just going to be installation today. But nevertheless, just as in baptism we remember our own baptism, at this point in time, as we install our elders, the words are much the same. And we remember the purposes to which God has called us and the honor of serving Him. For there are different gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who has served. God works through us in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves the divine purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit to use it for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. That we have different gifts. Together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. We work and pray to make Christ's church useful in the world. And we call men and women to faith so that in the end every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Within our common ministry, some members are chosen for particular work as ministers of the word and sacrament, ruling elders or deacons. In ordination, we recognize these special ministries, remembering that our Lord Jesus said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the servant of all. And if any wants to be first among you, that one must be the slave of all. For just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Would those who are going to be installed today please come forward? That would be Yvonne and Tammy. Speaking for the children of the for the children, for the people of the church, I present Bob Buckman in absentia and Yvonne Kerr to be installed as elders. Can you all come up front here come and face over. the congregation? Thank you. And Tammy Edwards to be installed as a deacon. Yvonne and Tammy, God has called you by the voice of this congregation to serve Jesus Christ in a special way. You know who we are and what we believe and you understand the work for which you have been chosen. Now I'm going to ask you some questions and then you respond as I 
indicate. Do you trust in Christ Jesus, your Savior? Acknowledge him Lord of the world and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Will you be instructed by the confessions of our church and led by them as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I will. Will you be faithful elder or deacon in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and continually guided by our confessions? If so, say, I will. Do you endorse our church's government and will you honor its discipline? Will you be a friend to among your comrades in ministry, working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I do and I will. I do and I will. And will you govern the way you live by following the Lord Jesus Christ, loving neighbors and working for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. And now, Yvonne, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship and instruction? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the courts of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. I will. And Tammy, will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. Do we, members of this church, accept these women as elder and deacon, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, answer, we do. We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, answer, we do. And even though this is not an ordination, but an installation, I think it is always good to have the encouragement and the spiritual uh, boost, if you will, of others. And so if you have served as an elder or a deacon, would you come and lay hands on these two? I think that this is important for the congregation to note because it tells us in James to lay hands on one another for healing and support and for strength. Let us pray. Almighty God, in every age you have chosen servants to speak your word and lead your people. We thank you for these women whom you have called to serve you. Give them special gifts to do their special work and fill them with the Holy Spirit so they may have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus and be faithful disciples as long as they shall live. Amen. Amen. Those of you who came up may go back to your seats. Tammy and Yvonne, you are now an elder and a deacon in this church and for this congregation. Whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God your Creator through Him. Amen. And we welcome you to the ministry in this church. We have much to give thanks for here in terms of the faithfulness of the people. As you come to the Lord with your offering, think about this. Is your gift an act of thanksgiving, returning back to God a portion of what you have already received? Or is it an act of faith, giving even as you wonder whether all the bills will get paid without it? True offering involves both thanksgiving and a leap of faith. What does your gift represent? As you offer it, silently speak your own prayer to the one who is right there with you always. And as our usher comes forward to take our morning offering, meditate on God's goodness and blessing in your life that you might give joyfully and cheerfully unto the work of his church.
Please say our unison prayer of dedication with me. Open our eyes and hearts to those we meet. Help us to see their need and to show your love and to use your gifts that are invested in us to bring them hope and life. We go now with unwrapped gifts ready to be used. We go as your servants ready to touch others with your love. And we don't go alone. Amen. Please be seated. Now is the time in our worship service when we have the joy and privilege of praying for and with each other. There are concerns which are listed in your bulletin. And I would ask you to look to those. Um, there are also joys of birthdays and uh, such. And so I would ask you to look to those and celebrate with those who have celebration, reason to celebrate, uh, and give them thanksgiving. Are there any other joys or concerns that are not in here? I have a praise. A good friend of ours, we're all 78, and a semi passed him, and ice fell off the vehicle and uh, smashed their windshield. Uh, bed was cut, but not really bad, but it, they were very right, thankful that they weren't hurt any worse than what they were. So completely shattered the windshield. So you have a friend who survived the road incident. Your husband was with her. He didn't have that. Just one more time. She had quite a few. Okay. Any other joys or concerns? It's always good to share joys. I don't think we do that often enough. Yes? Russell Street's surgery was successful, and uh, everything came back okay. So he's in the process of healing now. He'll be in the hospital for just a little bit more, and then it'll be about five or six weeks of recuperation. But praise God. <clears throat> so his surgery is successful, which is reason to give thanks, Russell Streets. But we still want to pray for recovery because he's got several weeks ahead of him. Okay. Any other joys or concerns? Well, seeing none, then let's come before God in prayer, knowing that He knows our needs better than we do ourselves. And he delights in answering prayer according to his will. God, our Father, creator of the universe, we just give you thanks and praise. We celebrate your goodness and greatness. You are such an awesome God. Lord, what you can do is beyond our comprehension. What you know is beyond our understanding. But we grapple with what we can understand, what we can know, and we hold fast to it. Knowing that your love is also deeper than we can fathom, but it is what tethers us to the new life we have in you. It is what gives us a reason to celebrate here in this world when there's so many trials and troubles. Lord, your goodness is without parallel. And even though we couldn't fix things ourselves, much as we hate to admit it, you knew that was going to happen. And so the Son came to show your love, to call to sinners and the lame and the helpless, and to heal them and make them whole. We thank you that you have done that with us. And we pray that you would continue to lay your healing hands upon those who are sick and are hurt, whether it be spiritual, physical, or mental. Lord, make them whole to serve your purposes and to do your will that they too might celebrate life, the life gained in you. Lord, we thank you for a friend who survived a road incident as ice smashed their windshield, but they were able to pull off the road. They were able to get it taken care of, and they had minimal injuries. We thank you for being with the doctors in Russell Street surgery, that it was successful. We pray that his recovery, which is several weeks in the making, would go swiftly, that the doctors would be amazed at the strengthening of his body, and the family would have reason to celebrate. And Lord, we know that sometimes it's hard to celebrate those who have lost loved ones and grieve, and grieving is good and natural, but we also pray that they will find reasons to celebrate even through that, as they hold on to your promise of a future, an eternity 
with you and with loved ones who also believe. And Lord, we pray that during this time they'll be able to see your goodness and see your love, particularly in the arms of those who surround them, and give them hugs and lift them up to your face. Lord, may it be a time when you get praise for your goodness in what you have done. And Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world as every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that folks might begin to know and we who see you face to face and have known you will celebrate with great joy and vigor the new age which is to dawn. Until that time, Holy Spirit, be with each one of us. Give us the wisdom to see what your will is to remember your goodness. Give us the courage of heart to step out in faith, to be vulnerable, to be celebratory, to step outside our boundaries sometimes, our, our limitations, the walls that we put up of reserve, and be infectious in our joy. And give us the perseverance of spirit to complete the tasks that you have for us to shrug off those who, restrained by their own understanding of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a follower, will inevitably question or dismiss. Help us to show continually and faithfully witness to the new life that you have given within us. A life that will burst the bounds of the old one. And Holy Spirit be upon this church, expand its boundaries and ministries, keep it from evil. May it be a light in the darkness of this world. May it be a beacon of joy and hope that bring others to know you, to experience your love and your grace and your mercy, even as we have experienced them in Jesus Christ. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, the same we taught his disciples when praying to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now if you'd stand with me if you're able. And we'll sing our final hymn, number 543, I'm So Glad Jesus Lifted Me. And let's do verses 1, 2, and 4. Glory, hallelujah, Jesus has lifted you. And he has given you reason to celebrate. May you go forth from this place, recharged, renewed, excited to serve the Lord your God and to celebrate the life he has given you, witnessing to all others about his grace and his goodness. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.